South Carolina gets another test. They failed the first one miserably. They've got a big one coming up, of course, against Eastern Division rival Georgia. We go to the source here, Chris Phillips, the Spurs Up show. We always enjoy the conversation with Chris. Chris, what is going on today? Mark, appreciate you having me on, man. It's always a pleasure to talk ball with you. And, uh, yeah, just getting ready for SEC play, right, to finally get underway. You know, for South Carolina, they had that opening season test, and and they failed, like many SEC teams have failed at this point. You and I were just talking off the air. SEC uh, has lost six games against Power 5 competition to this point. All six have been by double digits. So, uh, you know, as all these teams have question marks and things to figure out, I think we're going to start to learn a lot more about these football teams as we get into SEC play, so really exciting. You know, the Carolina-Georgia series, it's one that's special to me. I grew up in the CSRA, which is the Augusta, North Augusta, Aiken type of area right on the border of South Carolina and Georgia. So a lot of fond memories growing up around Georgia fans and some of those great games over the years. But certainly this is a stiff test for Shane Beamer's football team, a, a team that certainly has no lack of questions they'll look to answer between the hedges. Chris, what we learned in week one is something I did not expect to learn. And and you know that because we talked about that uh, North Carolina matchup a number of times throughout the offseason. If somebody would have said North Carolina is going to win this game, I would have not been surprised Mm -hmm. at all, even though I picked South Carolina to win. But if they would have told me that North Carolina was going to throw South Carolina around like they did at the line of scrimmage, we have not seen that out of the powder blue in forever against the decent opponents. So we won't dissect it from the North Carolina side, but nine sacks, 16 tackles for loss against that South Carolina offense held them to basically zero on the ground. You take the sacks away. Of course, it's a skewed stat, but still just dominance up front. That's what surprised me. Yeah, Mark, it was all of our worst nightmares came to fruition. Like you and I talked before, and that was something I, I hammered down in, you know, in the preseason, was that South Carolina's offensive line was a major question mark, right? You were, turning, you were returning 50 less starts than you had from a season ago when you lost Joe Von Gwynn, Eric Douglas, and Dylan Wanham. You replaced those players, you replaced that production with FCS caliber talent, call it for what it is. And South Carolina and Shane Beamer, they've done a great job in his first two years, identifying guys from these lower-level schools, right, Jalen Brooks, Juice Wells, uh, Carlins Platel, other players, if you will, and getting the most out of them. But, Mark, you know as well as I do, it's different on the line of scrimmage, right, especially on the offensive line. And there's a reason, you know, when you see these teams play each other, like when you see a South Carolina play a Furman, for example, you see a Georgia play a Ball State, whatever the score is, the biggest discrepancy of talent is in the trenches. And I think that's what you've seen, right? You know, they thought they plugged some holes with guys like Sidney Fugar and Jackson Hughes and Nee Manziel and, you know, Nick Gargiulo, who's been really good in the interior, by the way. But it's just been a very much so makeshift work in progress. And, you know, that's what you saw on opening night. I, I don't think anybody could have seen that coming, right? Nine sacks in that football game, like you mentioned, 16 tackles for loss. And, you know, I'll take it this, Mark, while the pass protection was much better against Furman in the game that just took place over the weekend, Gamecocks got that big bounce-back victory they needed, 47-21. to 21. The rushing attack was still just completely absent, wasn't a factor. 2.8 yards per carry against the Furman Paladins defensive front. So, Mark, I, I think you look at this football team right now and – you know, it's it's not the sexiest thing or most fun thing to talk about, but it's just it's line of scrimmage for South Carolina because right now, Mark, Spencer Rattler's playing as well as any quarterback in the SEC. Xavier Leggett has emerged as a top target, not just in the SEC, but all of college football. He leads all of Power 5 in receiving yards. You know, they get Juice Wells back healthy because he hasn't been in 100%. All of a sudden, you've got a, a great one-two punch there. They've got the skill position players, Mark, to really make some noise But as you and I both know, it all starts up front. It all starts in the trenches. That's been a problem on the defensive side as well, generating zero sacks in that first game against Drake May and UNC. And then, you know, against Furman, they had three sacks in that ballgame, but still you can see the problems there also. So it really is trench warfare. And, Mark, that's where the questions lie for South Carolina as they take on one of the best offensive and defensive fronts in college football on Saturday against, uh, against the Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah, until it's proven otherwise, Georgia is the standard. They have yet to be tested this year, haven't played anyone, so this is coming up against South Carolina. It's between the hedges. That's always a difficult task. Uh, South Carolina did pull off a miracle in 2019 going down there and uh, pick six and three picks off of a Jake Fromm total. 
And uh, it's going to take that kind of an effort to do it this mm-hmm. time because Vegas says this is a 26-point game. And, Mark, money is coming on the Georgia Bulldogs early. I think it actually opened at 25 and a half, and last time I checked, it was at 27 and a half. So people are expecting Georgia to cover. And, you know, listen, I, I partly don't blame them, Mark, because, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, this is a special game for me because growing up where I grew up, Carolina, Georgia, it felt like a great rivalry. You could always count on, right, Mark, the game's – being close, being competitive. Of course, South Carolina had that great run of success from 2010 to 14 when Steve Spurrier was there against Georgia. But since then, Mark, I mean, it's it's been ugly. Since 2015, only one game in this series has been decided by single digits, and that was South Carolina's win in 2019. Every other game has been a double-digit loss for the Gamecocks against the Dogs, including the 41 point loss last year. I mean, it was a complete bloodbath at williams Bryce Stadium a season ago. So I, I agree with you, Mark, for the, the recipe for success, the recipe for the, the massive upset yet again. You know, I, I think they've got to put this game on Carson Beck's right shoulder, right, and make him throw the football, make him uncomfortable. But again, you, you do that, and Georgia's got a fantastic array of weapons. They still have Brock Bowers. But I think for South Carolina to have any chance, Mark, they've got to slow down or even stop the running game offensively, it's, it's going to take a masterful performance from Spencer Rattler. I, I don't expect all of a sudden this is the week the running game gets going for South Carolina. I'm not exactly sure, Mark, how they're going to protect him and give him a, a lot of time to throw. I don't think they give up nine sacks again, right? But um, this defensive front is vastly superior to what UNC uh, featured in game one. I think it's going to take a great game plan from Dabble Loggin, Shane Beamer offensively. But the good news is Spencer Rattler, He's confident right now, and he's playing as well as, like I mentioned, any quarterback in the SEC. But, you know, it, it's Mark. It's going to take South Carolina winning, you know, winning the turnover battle three to zero or four to zero. Beamer ball will have to show itself in special teams. And, you know, I think Georgia probably would have to play their C minus or D plus game, and South Carolina play their A plus game for the Gamecocks to win this one. So, you know, realistically, but I, I do think, Mark, with all that being said, can South Carolina at least show that they're making progress, right? Because I don't just think it's good enough to say, okay, well, Georgia's vastly superior to you. This should be another blowout. You know, kind of this game, this series is turning into what I thought about the Clemson series going into last year, where it's like, at some point, you got to start giving these guys a more competitive game because Mizzou did it last year. Kentucky plays Georgia tight every now and then. Like, why is South Carolina, is it good enough to just say, well, Georgia's better than us. We expect them to blow us out. I'm curious to see if this is the game that the Gamecocks can show they're making progress. But obviously, again, it's a tall task, and some things have definitely got to bounce their way to even, I think, Mark, make this a second-half ball game in Athens. Chris Phillips, it's the uh, Spurs Up show. You can catch it right here on YouTube each and every day, Monday through Friday, noon Eastern time. Chris takes your calls, and he talks college football with you noon to 3 p.m. Eastern time. And Chris... Not to give you and the rest of Gamecock Nation little hope, but see, the issue I see here is everything that we talked about off the top. If this team looks sluggish against North Carolina and lost by two touchdowns and came out of the gate sluggish against Furman, where it was a one-score game in the second quarter, and it was about, okay, Spencer and the receivers aren't on the same page. There's some misconnections there. They got to continue to, to work the reps dropped passes, uh, blown coverages in the secondary that that need to be shored up, those sorts of things. But when the line of scrimmage play is the issue, you can only scheme around that so much. Yeah. I don't know what you do when you're getting just beat up front on both sides of the ball. Yeah, I think our good friend Jake Crane, Mark, uh, made a really good point on our show on Friday when he said that, you know, you look at the Colorado game plan, and the way that they're using quick screens and bubble screens and the draw game and, uh, you know, the quick passing game, sort of an extended handoff extension of the run, I think that's what South Carolina needs to do and will have to do. They're they're just – they're not going to be able to run the football more. Let's just get it out there, right? I mean, South Carolina ran for 108 yards against Furman. And I know that they were throwing the football of the yard. I totally get that. But, again, I just go back to 2.8 yards per carry. The UNC game, we've already talked about that. So – also, the defensive side, though, stopping the run. And I'm worried. I, I, I'm very, very worried about the Gamecocks' defensive front. You know, they lost Mo Caba after the UNC game, one of their top linebackers for the season. Uh, they're going to need a guy like Grayson Pup Howard, a true freshman, a very highly touted recruit, but a true freshman to step in there and play meaningful minutes. Also, you look at the secondary mark, Nick Eamon Worry. He's questionable for this game. That's 
arguably their best defensive player. So to your point, Mark, I mean, when you – here's the thing, because coming out of the Furman game, for example, so many Gamecock fans looked at that and said, oh, let's just go air raid. Let's throw it every play. Like, abandon the run game, ditch the run game. And I'm even guilty of that, Mark, because it's so easy, right, to go on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it, or go on social media and say, South Carolina should just ditch the run game. That is so much easier said than done in the SEC. Like, you can get away with that in other conferences, the Big 12, the Pac-12 – but in the SEC, Mark, you know as well as I do, if you can't run the ball and you can't stop the run, and most importantly, you cannot protect your quarterback, it's just going to be really, really tough sledding for you, right? And so I look at South Carolina. How do they scheme around it? Because they, they've they got the skill position players to go toe-to-toe with Georgia, and they've got the quarterback. Like South Carolina, they have the advantage at the quarterback position going into this game. When you have a quarterback, you have a chance – but will they be able to give him enough time? And Mark, just a semblance of, of, of just like the facade, I should say, of, of being balanced. That was my greatest concern coming in for this offense. When South Carolina lacks the ability to have any t- sort of balance and they put the entire game on Spencer Rattler and they're getting in second and longs and, and third and longs especially, you're almost giving Spencer Rattler no chance back there. So, you know, Dowell Loggins, that was the name, the offensive coordinator, Mark. We were keeping a close eye on, sort of gauging what's his offense going to look like. You know, is he up to the challenge? Is he up to the task? We're going to learn a lot about him over these coming weeks with how do you scheme around the offensive line? Because, Mark, again, you know as well as I do, offensive line issues be damned. This fan base is expecting to win and to compete in a game like Saturday. Yeah, he's going to earn his paycheck against this Georgia defense. There's no question about it because, yeah, you can say uh, abandon the run game, and I get it when you're not, when you're running into a brick wall time and time again. It seems like, what are you doing? It's second and 11. You're constantly behind the sticks. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Put the, the, the game in your best hands, uh, the hands of your best player, and let him fling it. But, yes, if you're dropping back seven steps, he's a sitting duck over and over and over, and those guys can just peel their ears back. Check out anybody, the Tennessee game against Georgia last year, and they just, you know, they gave up one touchdown when it was meaningful minutes because they just pe- peeled back. And they just crushed those Tennessee mm-hmm. tackles and came after uh, Hendon Hooker time and time again, and you just mm-hmm. can't play football like that. There is has to be a respect for run game, uh and, and something else, there there just has to be, or it just doesn't work. Now, you can lean heavy pass. There's no doubt about that. That should be the game plan in some manner and bring out every bell and whistle you can possibly find in the mm-hmm. attic because uh, that's the kind of game plan you need in this one. Well, and Mark, to your point, I, I was going to say, I, I think South Carolina's best bet truly is going with that that Colorado type of attack where, or whatever you want to call it, you know, and, I, and I, it's funny, I, I sound, this sounds blasphemous because South Carolina just fired Marcus Satterfield, their old OC last year, because way too many swing passes, way too many passes behind the line of scrimmage, but I actually think South Carolina, that's their best bet for generating or manufacturing some sort of running game. It just getting the football on the outside to your playmakers and asking your wide receivers, your tight ends, what have you, to go out there and throw some blocks. Because, again, Mark, I just don't see the Gamecocks having success in the trenches running the football. Like, this this is not all of a sudden the game where Carolina is going to find that rushing attack. So I think you're going to have to be really, really creative with it. Um, you know, I think if you can work the outsides a little bit, maybe every every now and then you pop one in the middle because, like you mentioned, Mark, you've got to find a way to get to second and five, right? Second and six, second and manageable, right? Because then it opens up the playbook for you. But if you're in second and 11 and you're getting in third and eight, I, I mean, Georgia's defense are just too good, man. And, and you look back at the Furman game, you know, South Carolina had a lot of success, uh, you know, going to the deep ball to Xavier Leggett and throwing the ball up and, you know, a lot of those 50-50 balls that they had in the Furman game, they completed, you know, th- those are not going to be completions against the Georgia secondary and against the Georgia defense. Spencer Rattler, I mean, Spencer Rattler, Mark, although the Gamecocks offensive line gave up no sacks, I mean, the heat was coming from Furman. Like, there were definitely times where he was hit as he threw. He had to scramble. So, I, I am fearful of what this Georgia defensive front will do. And, again, like I said, getting the football to the outside, getting it to your playmakers, letting them work. It, it, it's going to take a masterful game plan for South Carolina to have some significant offensive success. Has what you've seen in the first two games 
changed your mind about South Carolina football this year and what you expect? Not drastically, Mark, because I, I still go back to South Carolina under Shane Beamer has such a knack for improving from week one to week 13, right? So I, I, I see the pieces, you know, Mark, admittedly, this football team has the question marks that I thought they had. Um, now, it's maybe brought more into focus that I did not think five and seven. I don't want to say I didn't think it was possible, but I didn't think it was likely. Five and seven could absolutely happen. Like, if they don't improve up front, if they don't take some steps as the season goes, five and seven is absolutely in the picture. Because I, I look, you know, even Mississippi State's line of scrimmage, that could give them issues. Tennessee, we see what they're doing. Even Florida, Mark. They can, I mean, Florida can run the football, right? I know they didn't look great against Utah, but there's a lot of middle-of-the-pack SEC teams. South Carolina would have lost to Utah. Like, there's no question. Um, Missouri is going to give you issues in the line of scrimmage. Texas A&M, I, I know we all fell victim to drinking their Kool-Aid again, but they've got dudes in the trenches all of a sudden. Like, I know Clemson doesn't look great, but that'll be a challenge in the test late season. But I picked seven and five, Mark, over the summer. I'm not one to really change the predictions as we go because, like I said, Mark, you look at last year. I mean, Carolina, this is a program. This is a team. You lose to Florida 38-6, to and beyond, beyond all comprehension, you go beat Tennessee and Clemson. So I, I think it'd be foolish right now after just two games of play to mail it in and say the Gamecocks are doomed for, for a 4-8 and eight and 5-7 and seven season. Um, I think eight wins is sort of out of the picture for me, which I thought that was the best case scenario anyway. So I'm still sticking with 7-5, and five, you know, not looking too far ahead, Mark. The game, Mississippi State's a, a huge game, right? Because I, I felt like over the summer – I had South Carolina beating UNC, but losing to Mississippi State, right, in an upset. I never thought the Gamecocks would lose both of those games. I thought they would split them. If you lose to Mississippi State, assuming that this Saturday goes as we expect, Georgia gets the up. If you lose to Mississippi State, Mark, I think that's where five and seven really comes into play for this football team, which would be a disaster, right? Nothing short of it in year three of Shane Beamer. So, um, you know, I, I think they need a youth movement up front. They've got some really talented five- and four-star guys that they brought in that are true freshmen that, you know, maybe aren't ready to play SEC football, but it's a lot better than watching the same five guys get whipped in the line of scrimmage, which I think is going to happen if they keep those guys out there. I think they've just got some dudes that aren't built for the SEC, and I think for South Carolina for the long run, it'd be much smarter to go with those young guys, let them take their licks early, so at least, Mark, at minimum, come second half of the season, those guys – you know, they, they, they've they been in the fire, baptism by fire, if you will, and they're ready to make a big impact. So to answer your question, though, Mark, short form, no, it hasn't changed my thoughts drastically. But uh, as SEC play gets going, I think that's going to tell us a lot as well, and we're going to learn a lot about this game, Cox football team over the coming weeks. Mississippi State barely squeaked by Arizona in overtime at home on a measurement uh, at uh, on a fourth down play. Uh, so I was expecting the Bulldogs to turn in a better effort than that as a nine point favorite. So maybe there's some optimism there that uh, a couple struggling teams may meet in Starkville and South Carolina night game on the road night game at Williams Bryce as well for that oh, ball game. So I gotcha. think, yeah, it's at, it's at, it's at South Carolina and it was announced today, Monday, 7 30 PM kick. And we know Mark, you know, we all know South Carolina has been a different football team at night under Shane Beamer. So I, I think the fact they got that game at night is massive for South Carolina's chances. Absolutely. Chris Phillips, the Spurs Up show. It's right here on YouTube every day, Monday through Friday, noon Eastern time. Lock it in. Get there. Check out Chris and uh, his conversation on the SEC and college football, South Carolina at the top. All right. Appreciate it, man. Chris, it's great to see you. And uh, as always, love to have you on here talking uh, Gamecocks. Mark, anytime, my friend. Always a pleasure to chat with you.